Christ and is rolling from now on. Um, the conference here is a combination of the second conference for the IIC as well as a celebration uh, for the 40 year anniversary of the uh, set up of the School of Conservation here at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of Architecture, Design and Conservation. I know it's a long name and for that reason we usually use the shorter name School of Conservation and that may be how you will hear us refer to uh, during the sessions here today. Uh, the reason I uh, saluted you with uh, good morning, good afternoon, evening and good night is the fact that although we are assembled a, an auditorium full of uh, eager participants here in Copenhagen, the capital of uh, Denmark, and the time is just past uh, 1.30 p.m. here in Copenhagen, uh, we may have uh, visitors and viewers from all over the world since the session today as well as the two sessions tomorrow is being broadcast uh, via the web. Uh, so we may have, uh, apart from uh, Jonathan already being with us uh, from uh, Sydney in Australia, uh, a, a few hours ahead of us here, we may also have uh, viewers being up early in the Americas and uh, uh, watching what is going on here today. So welcome to all. Uh, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, or night. Um, I'm not going to say much more. I will uh, already now, and we may repeat that uh, at the end of the third session, but already now I would like to thank very much uh, a group of very, very dedicated students um, here from the School of Conservation who has been doing a hard work of setting up this conference over the last year it has been planned. Actually, two years ago, uh, a group of the students participated in the first conference in London and came back to Copenhagen and said to me, we want to do this. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, they did. And the result is what we have here now. And again, I would thank you all very much for your hard work. And I would also like to thank our organization, the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of uh, Architecture, Design and Conservation for the opportunity to use these rooms and for all the dedicated staff here in our institution who have helped us in organizing this event. And uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, our uh, IIC um, uh, partners who has been also working very hard on organizing this event. And after all these thanks, I will stop and I will give the word to our moderator for all three sessions, uh, Tina Slotgaard. And she is going to come up here to the podium and guide all of us to three very uh, intriguing uh, sessions, I'm sure. Thank yes. you, Tina. Thank you, Megan. Yes, hello everyone. I would like to say welcome to this first session. Please note, as Mikkel is saying, that the session and the following two that we will have tomorrow is being filmed, and that goes for the panel as well as the audience. The theme of this first session is education and employment across borders. Conservation is a small field, and collaboration across borders is therefore essential to broaden one's work experience and strengthen one's professionalism. Globalization has meant that it has become easier to find training and work placements abroad, which can also start conservators on an international career. In relation to this, the following three points have been taken into account. A, what advantages and disadvantages are associated with attending conservation training courses at institutions in other countries? The network acquired in this way during one's training can greatly influence later work options. However, does an international education always benefit the student and does it lead to a loss of potential conservation work in the student's own country? B. Internationalization also requires linguistic and cultural adaptation for the student 
at once educational institution, once workplace, and to enable the discussion of conservation matters in other countries. How do students whose first language is not English, for example, fare in comparison to native English speakers in regard to training and work abroad? Conversely, how are English speakers received in countries where English is not the first language? And C, how should links across linguistic, cultural, and national borders be enhanced? Should we aim to some degree of commonality across borders? How do the efforts to create standardization in conservation education terminology help us, students, the emerging conservators, and the field? How does this help skills transfer from one place to the next and skills develop within a person? The panel speakers are Megan Monaghan, Stina Ekelund, and Julian Bickerstedt, who will join us via the web. Unfortunately, Rene Larsen, who is going to speak today, has not been able to make it. After the presentations, there will be time for questions and debate. The first speaker is Megan Monaghan. Megan is a paintings conservator with a master from Queen's University in Canada in 2010. For the past year, she has been a Samuel H. Crest Paintings Conservation Fellow at the National Gallery of Denmark. Her previous fellowships and internships include Yale University Art Gallery, Canadian Conservation Institute, and Australian Museum. Go ahead, Megan. I'll just quickly introduce a little bit more about my sort of uh, professional experience so far, and then I'm going to talk a bit about um, the process of getting a placement internationally or abroad. Um, I decided to sort of address the leading up to the position because uh, it's hard to address both the leading up and once you're in the position. So maybe afterwards we could talk more about some of the challenges you face once you're in the position. Um, but uh, as Tina mentioned, I when I started at Queen's, one of the things I was very interested in about conservation is that it's a very international field. So right away I started researching um, internships I could do in various countries, thought about what interested me and, and what countries might be best for me to get the experience I wanted. Um, and I decided to uh, go to the Australian Museum for one of my internships, and I'll explain a bit about why I did that. And then after graduating from Queen's, I then spent two years working in the US at the Yale University Art Gallery, and then uh, now here in Denmark for a year. Um, so there were several reasons I sought international employment or placement in the first place. Um, first, I wanted the opportunity to work uh, with a range of different types of objects and paintings. Um, for example, in my uh, degree, I was learning about Australian bark paintings. I decided that was something that really interested me, and that's why I sought work in Australia and ended up at the Australian Museum. Um, then, once spending two years in the US, I realized I wanted more experience with old master paintings, so I looked for opportunities in Europe, and that's how I ended up in Denmark. Um, Secondly, I wanted to be exposed to different conservation philosophies and techniques. Um, every uh, conservator you work with, every institute you go to, every country has slightly different philosophies and techniques. And by going to those different places and learning those techniques, um, you can pick up a variety of approaches and almost broaden your sort of toolbox of conservation um, ideas and approaches. Um, and finally, the third reason was I wanted to expand my professional network. So conservation is an international field, and therefore we need to network on an international level. And so by getting out into different countries, you're meeting conservators from all over the place. Um, and each of those conservators is an invaluable resource to you. Everyone has a different experience and has built up all this experience in their um, course of their employment. And so eventually, there's probably going to be a question that you'll have and one person you met is going to know the answer. And so you can use those people to help you in your career, your whole career, um, every time you meet someone new. Um, so uh, I feel there's sort of two approaches that you can have going into looking for conservation work abroad. You can sort of figure out which areas you would like to live in or how far you're willing to move, and then only look for jobs or contact institutions within that sort of criteria for yourself. The other option is to make a clear idea for yourself of what kind of experience you want to gain and what 
job description you feel best fits your experience and then look everywhere for jobs that fit that description. Um, when I was finishing at Queen's, I didn't have anything holding me to my location, so I decided to take the second approach and I thought about what type of position I wanted, what I wanted to learn in that position, what kind of experience I wanted to gain, and I started looking for jobs with that description. And then through the process, what I would do was I wouldn't sort of prejudge any location or institution. I would apply to the jobs that looked like they would fit me best. And then after, start doing some research about the location. Um, and then you can start to see, you know, what's the cost of living there? Um, how would I fit into that community? Would this be a good place for me? And then, so that research helps lead up to your interview. So, you know, you're gonna need to research the location and know about it if you get an interview. And then at that time, after you've done that research, you can sort of decide if you still think it's the right position for you after talking to the institution and doing the interview. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the hurdles I feel that you have to uh, get over in your process of sort of going through this application process for jobs abroad. The first is simply our international applications being accepted. Um, I think there's a general misconception that when institutions post a job, they don't want international applicants. Um, and I think it's important not to make that decision without contacting the institution first. If it's not stated clearly in the application, from my experience, when you ask if they're accepting international applications, they almost always say yes. Um, I think it's important that you let them decide if you're worth the hassle. Um, as an international person, it does take a little bit more work to hire you, but if you're the right person for the position, they will feel like it's the appropriate thing to do and they will work with you to get there. Um, and so I would just say that when you write your cover letter to them, you explain why you want to be in that location, why it's important for you to work internationally. Um, you can even mention that you've done some research about visa options so they can see that you're willing to work with them to, to do the hard stuff. Um, I would also say that when contacting individuals or institutions in the country that you're interested in working in, um, don't be afraid to ask about other available opportunities in the country. You know, maybe they don't have something for you, but they will know if there is other opportunities and they can be a resource for you. Um, also ask about any financial assistance options because if anyone's gonna know, it's going to be the people that are working in that country. Um, I've really been very lucky to find a lot of conservators that are more than willing to help me um, research other institutions outside their own. Um, and yeah, even if it doesn't lead to anything, it never hurts to ask. Don't be afraid of asking questions. People like to give you information and help you. They want to help you. Um, the second hurdle is the long distance interview. Um, I think nowadays it's even becoming more so a little bit of a, a weird exchange because we've got video conferencing as an option and also telephone interviews. And then of course you could also travel to the location. Um, if you're applying for a lot of jobs abroad, traveling there is not usually an option for most people, but thankfully uh, people understand that. Um, and I think the best thing to do is to just uh, really prepare yourself. I know it's important to prepare for every interview, but I think with the long distance interview, it's important that it's difficult to get a feel for someone's personality when you're not meeting face to face. So. The advice that I would give is just to practice, maybe with a family member or a friend, practice sort of your tone of voice, uh, make sure your connection is good. This is a big problem. Um, I know that, I know people who feel that they haven't gotten positions simply because the people on the other line could not hear what they were saying. Um, so that's a really important factor in the long distance interview. Um, and then, Finally, uh, remember that not every employer will be comfortable with a video conferencing type interview, so make sure you always offer to do it by telephone or video conferencing, whichever they're most comfortable with, um, and sort of work from there that way, because if they're more comfortable, then your interaction will be probably easier. Um, the third hurdle is the visa, um, figuring out which visa is best for your position or your situation. Um, 
when you're looking for work abroad, a lot of applications will say things along the lines of, you must be legally allowed to work in the country. Sometimes they'll say you already need a visa. I wouldn't suggest applying for a visa before you get a job offer because there's actually a lot of visas, a lot of the good ones for students and young people, you can only apply once. And if you apply and you don't get the position, then you've wasted your one chance of getting that visa. So I think the best approach is to do the research, make sure you're eligible for the visa. In your interview and in your cover letter, you say which visa you're eligible for and why, so they know that you are legally able to work as long as you apply for this visa. Um, and then, yeah, that way, again, they see that you are a, a team member in the visa process, so they don't feel like you know, they're going to have to go through all this trouble for you that you're willing to be a participant and help in the process. Another suggestion for visas is universities and museums associated with universities will have a lot of experience with international visas because they have professors and students coming in internationally on a regular basis. So usually they are really quick with visas. They know the process really well. So if you're having trouble, um, sometimes it's good to uh, try to find something within a university or a university affili affiliation, excuse me. Um, and then once you've made your arrangement and you have this position, it is really important to start your visa process immediately. <laughs> um, of course, it's ideal to get your visa before you depart for the country. I, I, <laughs> you need the visa in most cases before you depart for the country. But sometimes what you do is you just hope that it's going to come and you book your flight. I wouldn't say that's the best approach. For example, my, my visa for Denmark took three months to process. And so my advice is more to research the timeline. Almost everywhere will give you a timeline, like one to three months or six to 12 weeks and make sure your employer knows the best and worst case scenario. And then you just have to be flexible. So make sure, I think the biggest thing I've learned is that you need a flexible timeline. So you, you just need to have some leeway time to let the visa process. You can't really have a set start date all the time. Sometimes you'll make it to that set start date and it'll be great, but often you'll need to push it a little bit one way or the other. Um, so yeah, I think it's just important to make your employer aware of this and so they know what to expect and you know what to expect. And I think that's the best way to keep everyone on the same page and flexible. Um, so yeah, the best way to help you through these hurdles, I think is, and it's gonna sound really simple, research and networking. Um, but the internet of course has a lot of information these days. You can find out almost everything you need to know on there. But I would also suggest calling embassies or immigration offices because your specific situation will always be different than you know, everyone else's. Everyone's situation is slightly different. It's always good to talk to somebody about your specific situation and make sure that you're following the right protocol. Um, and ask a lot of questions. I cannot stress this enough you might feel like you're really annoying, but just write down every question you have and ask as many people as possible because the more information you have, the more smooth your process will be. Um, I think it's really great to contact friends, family, colleagues, anyone you know who's ever visited that country or worked in that country because they can give you a feel for the cost of living. Maybe they'll have information about visas. They may not be in conservation, but they can provide you with some insight as to what the process might be like and what kind of things you should expect. Um, and then if you don't know anyone who's been to that country, Facebook, LinkedIn, blogs, there's so many places now where you can sort of put questions out into the internet and people will come back with answers and comments and it, it's a really good resource in that sense. Um, so I also found it extremely helpful to contact previous interns or students um, who have done the same position as you have or have gone to the same city as you have. For me, it's led to places to live, knowing which areas to live in. Um, they often know the visa process if they've came from the same country as you. Uh, it's very, very helpful. And so just ask the institution for contact information for previous interns or students who have done internships there before. Um, yeah, so, 
I think the greatest <laughs> lesson I've learned uh, while working abroad is you have to be flexible, you need to problem solve, and you just, everything will not go perfectly, but it always works out in the end. So you just have to kind of roll with the punches a little bit and know that you do need to have a little bit of flexibility, but just persist and it always works out. It just takes a little bit of time sometimes and, and you learn so much from the process. Um, never be ashamed to ask for help. You'll be so surprised how supportive and helpful your international colleagues can be when you're in a situation. Um, they, they will be there for you. Um, yeah, so in addition to the professional benefits of working abroad, you also get to see new places, meet new people, um, try new things, and just have the adventure of living somewhere else. Thanks. Do you have sound in this? Um, Stina Ickeland is the next speaker. Uh, Stina is a furniture conservator uh, with a bachelor from Karl Manstein Furniture Studies in Lundsjöping University in Sweden and has a master from the School of Conservation in Denmark. Stina is currently, currently doing her PhD project, Climate for Wood, at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and the Department of the Built Environment at Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, yeah, and I would also like to share some of my experience from studying, living, and uh, being abroad. Um, as mentioned before, I'm from Sweden, but I haven't lived there since 2003, so I've been away for quite some time. Um, I have my practical education as a furniture uh, cabinet maker in from Sweden, and then my bachelor's from uh, from Stockholm. So. Uh, and after finishing my bachelor's studies, I uh, moved to, Co uh, to Copenhagen, or actually I came here for an uh, internship, and yeah, I stayed for 10 years, <laughs> so <laughs> things change. <laughs> uh, and since I couldn't find a museum job after my internship, I decided to start my own workshop. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a new language, a new market, and uh, uh, yeah, new expectations, and it caused some challenges, I would say. Uh, and even if the Nordic languages are very similar, or it might seem for other people, <laughs> uh, or actually because of the similarities um, and the linguistic false friends within the languages, uh, I decided to learn Danish and to get to know the culture. And uh, then the museums started calling so I, after working five years in a museum uh, workshop at Royal Collections <coughs> and Museum of National History, um, I decided to continue my education uh, with a master student uh, with a master education at uh, School of Conservation here in in Copenhagen. And I had a very clear goal, uh, not much time, and I wanted to do it fast. So I did it, uh, yeah, as I wanted, and I finished in 2010. Um, during my studies and also between my studies, I've uh, had internships in other places. Uh, for example, in Italy, uh, with a long tradition of conservation and restoration of objects, uh, where I worked with interiors in Venice. And, um, but also more exotic places like Iceland. Uh, that might be a very odd place for furniture conservators since you almost don't see any living tree up there. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was very nice anyway. And in 2012, I had something as an unusual as a uh, fixed position as a furniture conservator at one of the major museums here in Denmark. Uh, when I received a phone call from Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, uh, asking if I was still interested in a position, a PhD position uh, at the Climate for Wood project. Uh, yeah, and it's a multidisciplinary project about uh, uh, climate related damage to wood. And of course I was. So I packed my bags and left <laughs> again. And today my everyday life is in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? 
uh, about uh, attending training courses in conservation in other countries. Uh, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask since I was quite established in Denmark before I uh, took my uh, master's studies here. Uh, but I can just give you my experience from it. Uh, um, I always knew I wanted to continue my studies after my bachelor's and I couldn't get it in Stockholm. So I knew that I had to go someplace else. And since I was living here and I had work experience and also kind of a, I knew what I wanted to do. So Copenhagen was the right choice for me at that time. Um, I've already learned the language. Uh, and also, yeah, kind of dealing with the Danes at that time, so I know what I was getting into. Uh, I, don't, I don't, yeah, I think it's different if you come from outside and you just start at the university when you don't really know anything about it. Um, and for me, the advantages are much greater than the disadvantages. Uh, you learn a lot from changing institution or even country. Um, that's not the same, this is the way we do it, it's more, but why, if you come from outside? And you can always ask that if you're a newcomer, you're not expected to know the same things as everyone else. And the disadvantages for me is more on the personal level. level. Uh, you all are always the newcomer, uh, and you are always outside your safety zone. Uh, but it keeps you awake. So. And the change to the Netherlands uh, and the Dutch frankness um, has sometimes been hard. Uh, I'm still struggling with the language. Um, as a part of my research project, I'm, I'm searching through old conservation reports, uh, archive information, and uh, trying to find uh, information about objects, all in Dutch. Uh, so my technical language and uh, writing reports or reading reports and uh, yeah, everything that's work related is okay in Dutch, but then we have the social part. Uh, irony, jokes, it's not that easy. <laughs> uh, and I think it's, but I think, still think it's very important to try to learn the local language. Now I'm there for four years, so I should and I will, I intend to. Uh, and it's mostly, yeah, as I said, mostly because of your social life. It's so much easier if you can communicate in the native language or the native language of the country. Uh, and it's usually around the lunch table. Uh, the most interesting stories pop up from your colleagues. And yeah, it's, it's very hard, to, it's very sad to miss those. And today English is my working language. Um, and as a non English speaker. I know my English far from perfect, but discussing conservation treatments, uh, technical descriptions and things like that, it, it's a part of my everyday life and I've learned to live with it. Uh, and I know that my text will be corrected uh, in a very critical way sometimes. <laughs> and it's of course, of course hard to get your things back with just red marks everywhere. <laughs> but I've decided to see it in a positive way and I learned quite a bit. Um, yeah, my English is improving, which is good. Uh, and there's also, I was thinking about this, when you're in, in a workshop with lots of non-English speaking people uh, or non-English natives in a, uh, working together in English, uh, we kind of develop our own language that the English speakers have, dif <laughs> have difficulties understanding. <laughs> because, the, yeah, that's how it becomes natural for a German, a Sweden, a French person to, to talk about things. So it's also a very interesting way of working together. Uh, and yeah, as I said, I think it's very important to see conservation uh, institutions, uh, private workshops and museums, um, either through an internship, a way you get behind the scene uh, or you're taking a year abroad or uh, making uh, taking a greater part of your education in another country and after yeah, the Bologna process and uh, university changes it should be easier uh, to take certain courses or part of your education in another country um, and since conservation is a very inter interdisciplinary field 
uh, exchange through uh, faculties and uh, uh, universities locally or abroad should be possible and and also in related fields like archaeology or art history and you know, material science, anything that it should be possible to take a course in something else. And I think that's really important for the conservation in institutions or like the schools to work on to make it easier to take uh, yeah, an interesting course. Um, yeah, and during my stay in different workshops, uh, abroad and also locally. Uh, I've seen and learned techniques and used materials I would never use again. <laughs> I think it's important to see and to, to know what is going on in the real world uh, outside your conservation school uh, to better understand uh, what is going on with the objects uh, and to be able to read them and to understand the conservation history because one day they might end up on your table. So even if you don't approve with the te technique or way of doing it, it's good to know what's going on. Yeah, and I don't know what I will do when I finish my PhD, uh, if I return to my home country, or if I continue my journey, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the objects we are handling are uh, the, from many parts of the world. And I think an international education will help understanding the craftsmanship and the materials and the techniques um, yeah, used when they produce the objects um, in another country and in another time. So yeah, I think it's very important to go abroad. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you, Stina. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Julian Bickerstedt, who is with us uh, via Skype. Julian received his education from Oxford University before completing a diploma in materials conservation, specializing in furniture. Before establishing international conservation services, he worked at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. Since 2009, Julia, Julian has been a vice president and director of communications at IIC. Julian chairs the Australian Museums and Collections Committee and is a board member and past deputy president of the National Trust of Australia. Julian, you go ahead. Uh, Tina, hi, hi. everybody. Um, I'm actually gazing at a blank wall with a sort of speaker in the corner, but I imagine somewhere behind me there are <laughs> serried ranks of uh, eager conservatives and fantastic to be able to talk to you from Sydney. Um, Tina, is that all coming through loud and clear? Yes, you're very clear. Good. Okay. Um, useful from my point of view to be able to talk after Megan and Stina um, from a slightly different context. I think they've both given a very useful perspective on the extraordinary profession in which you have chosen to uh, embark and in which we are at various stages uh, of our careers. It is indeed a truly international one, and uh, with that comes all sorts of opportunities. And I think the most useful thing I could do is talk to you today about my journey, um, and uh, which has been international, um, because off the back of that, I hope it will give you some ideas about how you might um, uh, pursue your own careers. Um, First of all, I set up International Conservation Services in Sydney in uh, 1986, um, uh, not uh, because I was planning to employ people from around the globe, but because I saw that, uh, interesting enough, Australia was a useful and possible springboard into international opportunities um, to share and work on conservation projects around the world. Um, ironically, or perhaps because of that, um, I, uh, of Hello, am I back on? I'm back on. 
Um, of the 25 staff that I employ, I have uh, uh, two English trained conservators, um, both actually in furniture, no, sorry, one in furniture, one in paper conservation. I have an Irish trained furniture conservator who then has spent most of his career in Scotland. I have a Canadian trained uh, paper conservator who trained at um, Queen's University, uh, where Megan trained. I have an Italian painting conservator. I have a Polish paintings and a Polish sculpture conservator, both trained at uh, Nicholas Copernicus University in Torum. Um, and in the past, I've employed Americans, Spaniards, Germans, Maltese, and even New Zealanders. So um, what I, I say off the back of that is that um, each one has brought their own particular skill basis and background. Um, yes, as Megan says, we do have different philosophies and techniques, but we do share very much a common language, albeit with uh, lots of uh, differences around what we mean by conservation and preservation and restoration and all these interesting terms we use. Um, I, I mean, I'm obviously from an Anglo-centric view, which is one that you largely share in, uh, in Denmark. Um, there is, in my view, a distinctly different view that both the French and Italian conservators have, and it changes again when you get into Central Europe. Polish conservators um, have what I call more of a sort of polymath view. They, they tend to have a, a much wider range of training. Um, the Anglo-centric view, largely American, um, North American conservators uh, uh, from that point of view. So um, the first point I want to make is that uh, there are enormous opportunities with your training to essentially uh, take it and export it to anywhere um, uh, around the world and indeed not to hide behind your training, um, in, but to look outwards to learn from other uh, different approaches that different countries and cultures have trained conservators in. Secondly, I just wanted to talk about the range of projects uh, we've ended up being involved in in Australia, um, because um, one of the things that I particularly enjoy doing is building a uh, company that has a very wide range of disciplines. And I, I really do think that is an advantage in the way we work together. Um, so that uh, I do employ paintings and paper conservators and sculpture and furniture and objects conservators, metals conservators, um, architectural conservators. Um, we're, we're actually uh, gunning hard into uh, the whole area of digital conservation at the moment, and I'm looking for digital conservators. And um, folks, while I've got to a very interesting debate I'm involved in at the moment is a acquisition by the Cooper Hewitt um, design Museum in New York of a piece of software, um, which is going to be a very interesting whole new area we're going to need to get involved in. So they're buying software um, as collectibles. And we all know already the whole problem of uh, obsolescence in this modern age of technology in which we live. Um, so uh, from that background of uh, a great range of skills, um, We've undertaken major mural and sculpture and paintings and archival and library projects uh, all of Australia. And we've built essentially our reputation on that. But um, the international nature of how we could bring those skills to bear is one that has been enormously uh, interesting to me. Um, from the start, uh, we were working in New Zealand, which um, I could say in the uh, confines of the room you're in, uh, some people see it as another state of Australia. I um, hope there's no Kiwis there. Um, but uh, the, one of the interesting projects that's come out of that is that we, as a commercial private conservation uh, organization, have now become a uh, museum. Uh, we're providing uh, conservation services to a museum, which used to have quite a large conservation department and has now decided to contract all of that to us. New Zealand has been very good to us, though, because it has been the springboard into a major project we've been involved in, conserving the historic huts of the explorers in Antarctica. 
Now, that is truly an international project. Um, I have been the technical advisor on that project from the start. Uh, initially, I provided all the staff uh, who had spent uh, six months either uh, during the winter working in one of the Antarctic bases or six months during the summer working out of the huts themselves. And we've employed an enormous number of conservators from around the world, um, some of whom, interestingly enough, have chosen and to spend another six months there, um, which uh, when, you've, when you've had 24-hour darkness for uh, four months of the year is a big ask. Um, uh, ironically, we're also working in a very hot climate at the moment. We're working on a big military museum in the United Arab Emirates, uh, dealing with a vast number of uh, different types of materials in a very different climate. Uh, we're also working, working in tropical climates in Singapore, um, I got back from Brunei last week where we're doing a big project. Um, and in each case, uh, the language is the same. I mean, uh, we, we run into conservatives from all over the world in all those places. Um, and uh, we can get in the huddle and basically talk the same language. So what um, off the back of that is um, my advice to you? First of all, do see yourselves as having international careers, even though you may um, end up spending most of it in one place, in one country, um, you're always going to have uh, an internationally transferable uh, qualification and career. Now, um, off the back of that, I'm a great fan of engagement in the wider area of cultural heritage. Um, I'm a reasonably, uh, well, I am an active member of uh, the other, uh, of conservation uh, organizations around, whether um, the American Institute for Conservation or ICON in the UK. I'm the vice president of IC, um, where my uh, fellow friend and colleague, uh, Mikel, is so valued. Um, but I'm also heavily involved in ICON CC. Uh, I'm on the organizing committee for our next conference in Melbourne in 2014. Do come, but come to Hong Kong for IIC as well. Um, um, I'm involved more widely in ICOM. I've, I've sat on the ICOM committee in Australia. Um, I'm involved in Museums Australia, the equivalent in the UK, um, uh, Museums Association, and what's now called the American Alliance of Museums in the US. Um, I've sat on the uh, Council of ICMOS in Australia, and uh, I'm actually president of one of the international scientific committees, the International Polar Heritage Committee, uh, which we've just signed up um, the National Museum of Denmark as a co-host for our next conference in May next year. That's where Polish, sorry, Polish, Polar, Polar Heritage um, Specialists, um, including Conservatives, get together. Um, and then I'm also a great fan of the work of the National Trust. I mean, that's been mostly in Australia, but I'm a keen member of the National Trust in the UK as well. So uh, do look at the 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 context in which we as conservators work, it's a vital part of um, where, where we're operating. Secondly, um, get to as many conferences as you can afford. There is no greater way of meeting other conservators and learning from other ones. You're, you're having a separate session uh, tomorrow on, on uh, networking, but gosh, conferences are useful. I, I think in Australia, because geographically we are isolated, uh, we probably make more effort than we might otherwise, despite the cost to get to conferences. Uh, but they are so useful uh, in terms of building uh, that wider fraternity and understanding. Thirdly, stick up your hand and get involved in the organizations, whether it is the local uh, conservation group in your country or your city, um, or whether it is uh, the big international ones. Um, um, principally, obviously, the two umbrella organizations are IC and ICOM CC. Uh, Mikkel is a walking and living example of how you can bridge the gap between the, the two, having been on the directory board of both IC and ICOM CC. Um, I uh, have tended to focus more on IC, and so I was on the organizing committee for ICOM CC in Sydney in 1987. And um, as I said, I'm on the current one for Melbourne in 2014. I was the uh, chair of the organizing committee for IC in Melbourne in uh, 2000. 
and um, I've just begun, I've been on the board of ISC uh, Council and I'm now uh, the vice president. Uh, my friend Amber is with you at the moment, uh, and you uh, uh, novel her for a great example of how she's become so involved in, in uh, the international position through her operation of ISC social media unit. Um, but separately with ISC, I've gained great satisfaction from uh, leading our Opportunities Fund. This is, an, is a uh, component of ISC which we see is enormously important which is reaching out to conservatives working in parts of the world where there is much less support for them. Uh, so we have a dozen organizations in uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, in South America, in Vietnam, where we support uh, conservatives um, and encourage them to benefit from a dialogue with IFC and coming to our congresses and using our publications. Um, the other area that I've uh, become very interested in is the whole dialogue around environmental standards in museums. Uh, I have a view that conservatives got left behind on this debate and that has been overtaken by other components of the museum world. And uh, IC and ICOMCC have now looped together and formed a task force essentially to uh, get back into position of leadership uh, and discussions around quite what environmental standards should be looking like and how sustainable they are. Um, and we are particularly looking at how we can help our brethren in, um, in less developed parts of the world. They grapple with the issue of increasing museum knowledge um, and wanting to understand uh, where they are So, um, in summary, um, uh, as both Nick and Christina have said, seize your opportunities, seize your opportunities to go anywhere, um, talk to as many people as you can, join as many um, chat sites as you can, um, and um, you will find that opportunities do flow um, from that. So, I think, um, Tina, on that basis, I'll shut up. I'm very happy to uh, uh, talk further as questions may come. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. I would like to thank all the speakers. And the session is now open for questions and any comments you may have. If you have questions, please raise your hand and we will bring you a microphone. And we kindly ask that when you, before you ask the questions, you state your name and where you're from before asking the question. Participants watching the session over the web are also welcome to ask questions or comment via the web stream or Twitter. And participants uh, using Twitter to post questions, please use the hashtag which can be viewed on the IIC Facebook page. Any questions out there? Um, Stina mentioned about uh, the language barrier problem that you had moving to a different country and that you obviously knew English already but then you had to learn Danish. Um, do you think there's, there's the same problem for English speakers moving, if I use here as an example, would that be a problem? Do you think that your application would be less likely to be looked at because obviously uh, people in England are not very good at learning languages. <laughs> um. I guess I'll address that because <laughs> I'm an English speaker and I went to a non-English speaking country. Well, it's pretty hard to say this is a non-English speaking country, seeing as everybody is fluently, <laughs> very fluent in English. But um, I did...
Sorry, I'll continue. Um, yeah, I was worried about coming at first, but I think, um, well, I definitely would suggest, so it's not working again. I'm sorry. Oh, it is. Oh, sorry. Um, I definitely would suggest trying to learn the language, not only for, uh, you might not make it far enough for it to help you in the workplace, but it's a great way to meet people. It's a really great way to meet people. Uh, and meet people who are going through the same thing that you are. They're new to the country, they're struggling with a difficult language. Um, and yeah, so it's a great way to do that. And also just because you'll start to recognize things and it will make you feel like you're more part of the culture. You may not really understand, but as soon you'll be so proud of yourself when you like recognize a phrase or you know what someone just asked you at the grocery store, you know this sort of feeling of being a part of the country, that helps you personally, on a personal level. Um, and here, absolutely, uh, you're fine as an English speaker um, in this country. It, everyone speaks English very well, and in the workplace, it's very simple. I think in some other countries, it may not be the same, but I would assume that if some of your colleagues probably most specifically your supervisor needs to be able to communicate with you at a certain level. Um, and I, I'd say that at a working level, that would be the most important. Um, whether or not you think you can struggle through your day-to-day -day life in a country without the language, um, that's sort of a personal thing. Some people are very good at languages, some people aren't. Um, but yeah, I think you do need a certain level of communication within your job that can be very difficult to um, work at the level you want to if you can't communicate with your supervisor. Thank you. And again, please state your name and where you're from before asking the question. Um, is Julian with us? Julian, are you here? Um, if there's no questions from the, um, the room, I have a question for Julian. Um, Megan was talking about how from an applicant's situation about the visa, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit, a bit about, you mentioned it shortly, a bit about how you approach it as an employer when you want to hire someone from outside of the country. Uh, I can. Now, I'm afraid I've missed the conversation about language barrier. Can I just make a comment on that first? Yes. Um, it, it matters at certain levels to us. We've just appointed a, a senior paper conservator um, where there's a lot of interface with the public. And we had, um, amongst a number of international applicants, we had um, a Colombian and a Spanish conservator both of whom's English was not good enough for them to take the role. And um, we, we couldn't consider them ultimately because of that. Um, conversely, uh, we appointed our Italian paint, painting conservator three years ago, and he had virtually no English. And that didn't matter because he was in, a, uh, in, a, in a, an assistant conservator role where his interface with the, um, uh, the public was limited. Um, he has now advanced enormously. His English is fantastic. He writes very well in English. So that um, it, it depends on what stage of your career you're at, I think, how important that uh, language is from our point of view. Um, coming, though, to your next question about visas, um, 
it, it's, it is an issue. Um, Australia operates on a thing, uh, a process called a 457 visa process, whereby you can get um, a four-year visa uh, to work in the country relatively easily. Uh, getting permanent residency in Australia is, is, a, is a big drama. Um, but uh, you can either get six months, which we don't um, go for because um, we, we don't find... Oh, no, that's unfair. We've had some interns for six months. Um, but we mostly try and apply for four-year visas for our uh, international staff. Um, and uh, we generally have no problem getting those. Uh, we have to prove that nobody in Australia is able to fill that role, which actually is relatively easy by tailoring specifically to the skills of the person we're trying to bring into the country. So uh, we play an active role in that. It's an expensive process. I mean, um, just to give you some idea, we're sponsoring on a 457 visa one of our incoming uh, staff members. It's costing us 7,000 Australian dollars, which is about the same in US. It's about a 7,000 US exercise, which we as an employer have chosen to cover. Um, in museums in Australia, uh, the the um, person filling that role would need to cover it themselves. The government, public museums, wouldn't cover that. So does that sort of answer the question? Yes, I think so. I think it's, uh, I found it, uh, I've been looking at um, jobs in different parts of the of the world, and I, I find it, and I'm sure that's relevant for everyone here, that it's a problem. You really need to find that one, if you're not able to pay it yourself, if you're a student and maybe doesn't have a lot of money, you need to find that one where they are willing to pay that and do that effort for you also and engage in that commitment that it is you working for them and they're hiring you and making the visa process, um, um, come. Uh, <laughs> how do you say, um, making it come through. I think that's important. Graham? Is this on? Yes. yes. Stina, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you're on your third language, uh, that you obviously did your first in Swedish, then you said you decided to learn Danish, and now you're working uh, in Amsterdam. But one of the, we're very aware with an IIC, as we're based in London, mm. that we are very Anglo-centric. Um, and one of the questions was, uh, I mean, you're, you're you're using four languages. Has English actually helped, or do you find that you still have to dive in? You mentioned learning Danish. Are you having to dive in and, and learn Dutch as well to properly do your job? Mm, yeah, <laughs> in a way I do, since I do sit with lots of uh, reports, old reports and everything, and I go back in archives. And if I didn't do that, if I was just working in the workshop or doing uh, some other work at the Rijks Museum, I wouldn't need to learn Dutch. So it's more my specific job. And uh, yeah, I would say it's more for the social part, understanding people. Uh, yeah, uh, most Dutch people speak very good English and they prefer speaking English if you're not really good speaking a uh, Dutch speaker. So therefore, it's really hard to learn to speak Dutch. Have you thought, have you thought of looking at work uh, in other parts of Europe where English perhaps isn't quite so widely spoken? Yeah, it would also be fine with yeah. me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I w I w I've been looking for um, PhD positions, positions also in France, for example. And yeah, there are. I'm Martha, I'm from Norway, and I've studied in Sweden and here in Denmark. I have a question about ethics. As a student, do you conform to the ethics in the country you come to? And uh, as an employer, do you impose in your own ethics to the people who come and work for you? Do you want to answer? <laughs> um, I think it's important to be sensitive to um, the possibility that your ethics are not exactly the same as the country you're going into. Um, I've never felt that it's forced on me, but 
part of the reason why you're working abroad is to learn different approaches and different ideas. Um, and so, yeah, as Stina mentioned in her talk, you have the advantage where you can say, well, why do you do it that way? Because you, you're, you're allowed to be a bit naive to the situation. You're allowed to discuss with them, you know, well, we've ne I've never seen this before. I've never done it that way. Could you explain to me why you, you approach it this way? Um, I think it's important to just try to learn from the new experiences. Um, it can lead to a very awkward situation, I think, if you try to press your ethics on anyone um, when you're coming into a different country. Uh, of course, you have ideas about what you're willing to do and not willing to do, but by entering a new environment and a new country, you do have to have some flexibility, as I said, and some openness to new things and new ideas about the field. To be clear, the question, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The que the, 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 can you just repeat the question? Is it on? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, as an employer, how do you handle the different ethics? Do you force your ethics on them, or are you comfortable with them using their own ethics in their work? Um, I, I'm hesitating because um, it, ethics, I'd have to say, from my point of view, having worked in conservation for almost 30 years, is not an issue. And um, that may shock you, but don't be shocked by it. It is that um, ultimately we have very, very few ethical issues that we come up against uh, in terms of disagreement. That doesn't mean that we don't have a very strong ethic about the way we approach conservation. But I find uh, we have different approaches. Um, and um, as I've mentioned to you, I, I think simply what I call the Central Eastern European view uh, does have uh, certainly a different approach to uh, aspects of conservation. But in terms of being ethically challenged, um, I, it very rarely happens from, from our point of view where we sit down and say we have a very different uh, value base under which we're judging how we proceed with this conservation. Now, where the question does arise, I would suggest, is um, in, in East Asia. Um, we are running the IC Congress in Hong Kong in 2014 um, around the basis of ultimately uh, the enormous continuity of, uh, uh, of Asian traditions. Um, I can tell this group that I put up a plea that one of the uh, um, themes for the conference when, when Council was considering what to theme that conference would have been to try and tease out the very different approach, and you could call it, in this instance, ethic, uh, between the, um, the Asian view on conservation and um, the, uh, the European one. And um, for those that you've been to China, um, it, it is mad. I mean, you, you go to some of these, and they look like brand new. I mean, their, their approach is um, probably best described as renovation, I suppose. Um, now, we as conservatives would be very ethically challenged with a lot of that. Um, they tend not to employ conservatives. They employ, ultimately, artisans to remake components um, that have been damaged. Um, now, that's a very broad statement, and there's, there's a lot of good conservation going on in, uh, in Asia. But... Um, uh, that's where some of the challenges occur. But, I mean, I can rock up into Brunei, as I did last week, and, and we're all on the same page immediately. I was looking at a, a, a large collection of ancient Qurans, and uh, their approach um, in that instance is, is um, very close to how we would approach them. So, um, very important to have a, a strong ethic behind us, but I, I wouldn't say that I, as an employer, find ethical questions, the things that, um, that uh, challenge us on a daily or even monthly basis. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? You're also free to, if you just have a comment or something you'd like to have elaborated. Yes, Marie. 
Right here. I only wanted to say on the subject of language, um, going back to that, um, I'm an unusual um, English person who speaks fluent French. I mean, they, they do exist, but I think it's really important to look as language as a tool as well. I went to France and I didn't speak French, but I, uh, but by working there, I learned the language and um, I can do bookkeeping in French, but not in English, for instance. So, so it's not uh, it's not ever a question of translating, and it's not something to be afraid of either. And I think that is a, a huge problem in England, which uh, is the people see it as a barrier and not as a and not as a tool. So. Uh, I know I'm speaking to the converted here, but uh, that's my own point of view. And I, I did it, and I, I, I spent 25 years abroad, and you know, it's um, went back to England to do conservation. But uh, but it's um, it's very important um, for English people, I think, to 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 step out and and use language. So that's I just wanted to say that because I know that uh, it's a <laughs> an unusual point of view from an English person. Conservation, conservation, um, and as a student and so soon to be newly educated conservator, um, I'm also considering if I should go abroad and take internships abroad, and it's something that really interests me as well. But then I've started to think about what if I want to have a family at home, and how would you balance the two things if you don't want to move them around, but you do want to go abroad? That's I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my answer is that I, I don't have family. Like <laughs> so, so <laughs> I don't have a family of my own with kids and so. So in my family back in Sweden, they don't expect me back, I think. Uh, <laughs> but it is, of course, you, you miss your friends and you miss being around, surrounded with your family. Uh, and then when you're out, you meet people from other countries uh, having their kids brought yeah, with them and you meet it everywhere. I don't see it as a problem, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think you can make it work in a lot of different ways. I also don't have a family right now, but I would like one. Um, and I think I see as you said, when you're out, you see so many different situations. I mean, there's people who take like a sabbatical year um, where they're only apart from their family for a year, say, or you can do things like bring your kids with you, um, which you also see often. Um, and Or you can sort of decide on a timeline for yourself. I mean, personally, I've sort of decided that I'll spend the first five years of my career just trying to keep consistent experience. And in that case, I'm willing to go abroad right now. But after those five years, I've decided I'd like to make a decision about, you know, some stability <laughs> in my life. So, you know, I think it's a very personal choice, but you can definitely make it work in a number of different ways. I don't think that there's any like, oh, if you want to work abroad, you can't have a family or vice versa. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Talita Loftelborn. I uh, just graduated from Camberwell College of Art with an MA in Books and Archival Materials. Um, I'm definitely interested in going to other countries and working in other countries. Um, and But I'm wondering, um, I'm willing to learn the language, but I'm wondering how, um, how many countries are um, writing their reports in English, if that's ever something that happens, or how much technical knowledge I would have to undertake because I think going to the shop and um, doing my grocery shopping and running errands in a different language is one thing, but writing a technical correct report in another language is, is something quite different. Um, so maybe Julian or someone else here who's attending could give some perspective on which countries use English predominantly and which ones don't, um, and how much of a hurdle that would incur. Mm. 
Yes, as I understand it, it's, um, it's, uh, the question is around is, is how important is, is uh, the ability to write well in English or in, indeed in a foreign language uh, in, in terms of where you're working. Um, look, it's a good question, and it's one that we do struggle with. Um, uh, I'd have to say that um, my Polish employees um, really struggle writing in English still, and um, a, a couple of them I've employed for almost 20 years, um, whereas um, uh, my Italian paintings conservator is writing fluently in English and, and is giving a paper at our national conference in Adelaide in, in uh, two months' time. Um, I, 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 I've come to the view that I employ um, conservators at two levels, really. One is uh, I, am, I employ a number of people who are really uh, very good practitioners and uh, can do enough to get away with um, the documentation and reporting that goes with that, um, where it's not so important. Um, then I employ conservators who uh, take in a sense a broader view and want to publish. And uh, to do that, uh, their, their English really does need to be a lot better. Um, we've, we've undertaken some training and we've had external uh, people, um, as in report writing uh, for non-first um, language English um, speakers. Uh, we've done some training to help them with that. Um, Ultimately, if you really want to do it, I think um, it, it's not a. It, there are lots of tools and courses out there to get you writing in your non-native language, and uh, that needs pursuing. Um, but perhaps the other thing I'd say around that is that if you do want to um, uh, be seen internationally, you do need to publish and give papers at conferences. And uh, that is a challenge if it's not um, if, if that conference is not in your native language, obviously. Um, yes, I wanted to say some. I'm Julia. Sorry, <laughs> I'm from Germany and I study at the Technical University of Munich. And I wanted to say something to the to your question. Um, because I just did an internship in the Netherlands and afterwards in Peru. And in the Netherlands, for example, English is as widely spoken as here in Denmark and the work langu language with English. But when it came to the reports, they were always in Dutch. So at least the ones that were for the clients, because it was a, yeah, it is a restoration center. So I would write, I speak some Dutch, but I don't, I'm not able to write a report in Dutch. So I would write my reports in German or English, and then somebody else had to translate them. <laughs> And um, I don't know in Germany, but I actually never came across an English report, I think. But obviously, everybody understands, like, um, almost everybody understands English. So maybe if you work in a museum and it's for their, just for their personal archive, I, I think that would be fine. And I don't know, in, I, I have never worked in Spain, but I can say in Peru, nobody really speaks English. And I don't think that I, they would have accepted English reports. Yeah, that's just my. May I just <coughs> add something? I'm Cornelia Weyer from Düsseldorf, so from Germany too. <laughs> and uh, we have international interns. Like at the moment, we have two people from other countries one from Portug Portugal and one from Japan. And um, we heard about lunch talks, one lunch con conversations that you couldn't follow when you first came to the new country. <coughs> My observation is that there are also some meetings with, within our team that we mostly speak in German and sometimes we have some inserts in English to have our colleagues from the other countries incorporated, but we certainly cannot speak like two hours in English when 19 people are German and two are not German and some of my colleagues do not feel so positive and so free to speak English for two hours. So I think something that you could would have to consider if you plan to go a country like to Germany <laughs> and you are not a German speaking person, you will meet people who speak English and you can ask them questions in English, but you will have to overcome situations 
that are clearly German speaking uh, situations and you have to be patient for a while. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Ferry. Uh, I'm American. Um, I now live in Denmark, so I've kind of gone through a lot of hurdles. Um, and to answer your question about uh, reports, when I moved here, they gave me a cheat sheet with like Danish English translations of technical words to write in the reports. And then I just printed off a couple examples of the text that they used to explain things, and that was really, really helpful. So I kind of did my own little investigative research into it, and then obviously had them check it. And a lot of the time it was very, very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and Google Translate is horrible. <laughs> so um, learning the language and taking classes can really help you for simple, simplifying, um, yeah, everyday conversation and lunchtime talk and meetings and uh, trying to uh, have a social life um, when you move to a new country. And Louisa, uh, you can do what I did and move to a new country and start your family there. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there's many different ways to do it and I definitely encourage going abroad. Um, I think it's only, yeah, I did my, um, part of my undergraduate in Italy and uh, worked there, and then I went to the UK and uh, graduated from Northumbria in 2012, last year. So, and now I'm in Denmark, and now I'm starting a family, so maybe we'll move abroad, who knows? So the future is kind of in the air, but going abroad would definitely just help you and broaden your, your knowledge in the conservation world and keeping in contact with those people that you meet is very, very valuable. So you can call on them later when you have questions. Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Amber Kerr, and I'm a paintings conservator at the Smithsonian and one of your speakers tomorrow. But I wanted to interject and say that I'm definitely going internationally for internships, especially early on, people love students. They're very patient with students. So getting that experience in your student years is fabulous. I was fortunate to spend a summer in France with some students at the University of Paris Sorbonne program um, at a chateau. And we were able to learn each other's languages a little better. I spoke some French, but it's definitely improved by the end of the summer. And we actually assisted each other in creating bilingual reports. So we actually took the advantage of each other's languages and created these bilingual reports so that future students who went to the chateau could actually speak different languages and be able to do use the same report format, but be able to see all the words in different languages. So you can proactively take your language somewhere and assist them in making their labs bilingual or trilingual or whatever, but adding these, adding our languages to what they have too if they're open and receptive to that. And I find that a lot of places, especially internationally, usually are. So that's just a added comment I'd put into this. Hello, my name is Anton, and I am from Sweden. And I was wondering if you want to go to work, for example, in the future in Syria after the war and work with that kind of questions, or if you want to go to Congo or you know mm -hmm. these kind of places, how do you do that? And where do you search those kind of <laughs> work, so to speak? Because it feels like right now we're very, very focused on the European and world heritage, we have so many problems in other countries. And is it, is this a question for the UN? Do they have any conservation issues or questions or these kind of things? Yes, thank you. Does anyone in the room have a comment for, for this question? Okay, it's me again from <laughs> Germany. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I had the same problem because I also wanted to go outside of Europe and I wanted to go to Peru with it, with this, which is also a bit. And I just tried to search via the internet and I made um, 
the uh, experience that, especially in these countries, so to say, um, people are really helpful. If you just find a museum and then write them, they will, in general, write back and be really happy that somebody from Europe is actually interested to work there. And um, yeah, but you always have to say straight away that you don't want to be paid because <laughs> But yeah, I actually, because I afterwards I discovered that somebody just didn't write back after some times because they thought that I wanted to be paid and then they just stopped writing. So, <laughs> and then you can do an internship at the UNESCO World Heritage. Um, yeah, but it's a really specific um, application process. So, but you can Google it and find it in the internet and they will guide you through. and. There you can, I think you can choose the country where you want to go, and maybe you can contact somebody there. And if I could just uh, leap in there, it's, it's interesting to look at IIC membership to understand um, where basically conservators, uh, as we see conservation, do work. And um, there are incredibly few working throughout Africa. Um, South America, it's slightly more um, um, possible. And indeed, I talked earlier about the Opportunities Fund DIC is running. We've uh, actively in engaged in creating a Latin American group for IIC, uh, which will be based in Lima in Peru. Um, and we're hopeful that, that will open up dialogue um, with um, the conservatives that are working in South America. Um, Africa. Um, Really, the best way in is through South Africa. There are a number of conservators working there, and they are members of IC. Um, coming back to Syria, um, the route in probably is either through uh, Turkish conservators, um, and uh, again, IC has some members in Turkey, um, or through Egypt. And there is a growing number of conservators working in the uh, the Gulf region, in uh, Doha, in Qatar and in Dubai, um, as well as in Egypt. So um, I would suggest you turn to the, uh, the two international bodies, ICOM CC and IAC in particular, um, who probably could provide introductions. Um, hi, my name is Fanna, and I'm a student at the Danish School of Conservation. Uh, I lived in Thailand for six months and did some conservation work and some projects. Uh, and my experience is that we are very fortunate in our field because we have so much documentation. Uh, in Thailand, there were very few people speaking uh, English in the field of conservation. And the way we got ab about it was by through documentation that you can uh, you can understand each other and the damage, and you can do look at a picture, and you can say, what is this, and can you see this over here? But it worked out, but it's difficult, but I think documentation helps a lot. There are no more questions uh, or comments. I think we should. Um, we also were missing the speaker, so that's why we're running a little early. I think we should close the first session. And soon there will be coffee in the next room for the people who are present. <laughs> um, the people at home must make their own coffee. <laughs> Um, also, uh, this evening there will be a conference dinner which will take place at the School of Conservation, uh, the same place that we were this morning for registration. Um, yes, so I'll see you then and please feel free to roam around and have some coffee. Thank you. Thank you. session totally. I would like to thank the speakers uh, one more time and uh, we have a little thing for you. For Thank you for <laughs> participating. <laughs>